the easiest way to describe what happens is sometimes it happens because it happens. And a lot of times when you're developing internal tooling, you see a need and you reach for something outside the world and it doesn't really exist or doesn't fit your purposes or it's maybe too general. So you then go and build something. And as a, uh, many of the, the, the more successful startups of the last generation do, things that they needed to operate their business just didn't exist at the time. So they had to go reach for something else and go build it. And in our case, what it was is we hit a certain size of our engineering organization. We were delivering so much code each day so quickly that things just became unmanageable. And the team that was responsible for one end of that just was underwater constantly. And you had to put some, something in place. And you could talk about social aspects or programming aspects or even operational aspects. But at the end of the day, we needed to get more rigor into the system. We also needed to put some more safeguards in place. We needed to give some more bespoke paths to get code from a developer's machine to production. The easiest way to describe um, this in general is that they have different concerns. So if you think about uh, what we would traditionally call ops um, in the infrastructure or platform side of the world and app eng in the engineering side of the world working on things, the application engineers, and they, they need to move as quickly as possible. And they're, they're incentive structures or the product managers or things of that nature are trying to get them to move as quickly as they possibly can. And the operation side of the world, they need as much safety as possible. And if you think about that, the goal of someone like myself as a CTO of GitHub, who's in charge of everything that's going on in GitHub is to allow as much of that speed as possible, but in the context of that safety that is happening. And with different incentive structures, there's going to be some tension but if you can find a way to, to marry those two together, then you've got some successful internal organizational um, dynamics at play. So GitHub was a special place in that it grew up in the 08, 09 era of software, roughly when Heroku started as well. And at a time, if as long as you would just put a PR into GitHub, it would automatically get released to production. And there was some bash scripts behind the scenes, just honestly, like, I, like the world runs on bash, right? And, and that's what it was. There was just some bash scripts that put it all together and automatically released it to the one monolithic structure that we had in place. And, you know, GitHub for a long time ran off of one data center. It was data center driven and it ran off of one data center, one cluster, one everything, but that doesn't scale and you can't do that once you get a certain size. So then you have to release to pods and you have to release to, um, you have to gate releases and all of that. And then all this becomes incredibly sophisticated and hard to do. And then again, if you're running that through bash, you they don't tell wall street if you go public on that, because that's not going to go well. Um, and so at some point you have to develop something else. So largely we try to keep the workflow the same, which is if you put a PR in it might go into a release train or it might do something different, but at the same time you're trying to change how it gets managed and released on the other side. And that's really when, when we hit that scale in operations, or the, we call them infrastructure, the infrastructure team was responsible for coordinating all of those things that were happening and how to release it. It was unmanageable. You couldn't do it. You couldn't scale that with people. If you did, you'd be talking four or five X the number of people that you currently had on staff. And that's just a bad solution. So they started to you know, work smarter and they developed our own um, internal IDP. Two things at play. One was, uh, uh, it very much started grassroots. The infrastructure team at GitHub is one of the, the best in the world, as you might imagine. And they, they were underwater. They were frankly um, just, it was, it was, we were growing too fast on one side of the fence and we weren't actually investing enough on, on that side. And they said, we, this is how we're going to get in front of this. And they did a great job of forward thinking and what to do. And then on the other side was we tried to keep the speed up as much as possible. But we had a couple of missteps and a couple of breaks and they were, they made us realize that we didn't have what I would call, say this is the safety mechanisms in place. They allowed us to go off path too often. And the truth is that we, we had grown past the point of a single monolithic Rails application being able to be deployed to a single monolithic database cluster. It just, it didn't work. That is not the way the world worked for us anymore. 
And when you take into other concerns too, like security or things of that nature or logging or auditing, then you start to realize that there is too much that's happening for any one person to really be fully concerned about the entire, the entirety of those concerns. And it would be foolhardy for us to think anything different. So from a numbers driven perspective, um, I didn't do any real analysis and I had, and I admit I had the luxury. There was no, um, this was before we were acquired by Microsoft that we started to develop this. And at the time I was in charge of all of GitHub. I was the, um, I was the CTO in name, but I was, um, we did not have an active CEO at the time. And so I was able to just make the call to do it. And so, um, you know, I had some luxury, but had I needed to make the case, I would have done headcount analysis and saying, we're able to get away with X now if we do this investment, but we're going to require Y, you know, or, or X, you know, times three if we don't, and, and to do this from a human scale perspective. Um, and the other side of the fence too is uh, just how fast we could possibly go. There's no way to do a real analysis on that, but we would have slowed down and become a much, as organizations grow, they become much more um, mediocre in speed. And if you really care about that, this is one of those investments you make. It's all based upon Kubernetes for us. Um, we, we, it's something called Moda um, internally. It's a uh, chat ops driven um, via Slack because we're, you know, GitHub was one of the early practitioners and might be one of the last remaining practitioners of chat ops driven for what it's worth too. Um, but the, it's based on Moda. It's got uh, containers wrapped around it. It's got our own internal catalog we, um, that manages the services for us. They're all hooked together with SLOs, all of that. All of this is bespoke. We had to write and develop all this because none of this existed in the world. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm being very hand wavy, but you can kind of get the idea of what is happening here is that there's an SRA group that manages the, ca the, the catalog of services. There's another group that's inside that that's developed, that's man managing Moda and all the integrations it's doing. We've got some bespoke, what we call paved paths for languages and frameworks and different things that need to go into it. That team that manages Moda also maintains those packages. Um, you've got different people maintaining different parts of the container itself. And the way I'll, I'll use my hands here real quickly is mm -hmm. one of my favorite things that I saw that um, that team did early was understand that they're going to take concerns away from the application engineering team, which says, as long as you fit inside this container, you get certain guarantees. So if you can put your application inside this bucket, we'll take care of logging, we'll take care of auditing, we'll take care of monitoring and alerting and all the catalog integrations because it's all hooked into the container for you. If you try to move outside that path, as long as you work within the bucket, you have so many things that are magically given to you for free. And um, obviously it's not free. There's an entire very smart, dedicated sets of teams on the back end managing that as their day jobs. And that's, what, that's why it's magical. And it's, it, it works out really well. And my favorite part of this, this is why I like this so much, is that it allows you to scale your organization. You don't have to have somebody who cares about, in the application engineering team, care very, very deeply about DDoS protection. They can go and work on that on the edge. And then you don't have to have your compliance people also be spread out in the organization. They can, very, they can care very deeply in one specific area. And as long as that concern is represented in the container construct or the, the IDP platform in such a way, it's there. We use chat ops again, we're using Slack so people can say, hey, we want to pull up a new Moda, blah, and we want to see what's going on. We can just hear, um, issue a couple of commands, things pop up. Actually, largely just think of Slack as our command line interface and just whatever Heroku does, Moda does. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to see what's going on, inspect it, you can just run a, a command, it'll point you over to the cluster, see what's going on. You can issue some um, commands in there and it'll tell you the, the status of it. Catalog, um, the, what we call our internal um, service management tool cat catalog is where you go and check out the SLOs, um, see how it's running, um, that nature. Uh, th what I've told people is if you want to interact with your code and Moda, try to go use chat ops. If you want to see what's happening, you need to go to catalog. Um, the chat ops should eventually pull all the catalog data as well. So you can go bi-directional, but uh, for the most part, um, I just think of this as replicating 90% of what Heroku does. This is a generalized statement, but most organizations as they grow um, have the who moved my cheese element, which is if you're not familiar with the concept of who moved my cheese, it's just that change is hard and people don't like it. They like, they, ha they have this rosy picture of what used to be versus what could be in the future. So anytime you make a change, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. 
And I think in the case uh, for us was many people thought that we were getting too big. Mm-hmm. They thought we were losing some of our grassroots, some of our nimbleness and what made GitHub special in the first place. And I have some sympathy for that because as startups go, that is the most common mindset, which is um, we're losing our soul a little bit. Um, the other side of it too was um, the application engineering team did not like to feel constrained. Um, typically, they they have their concerns. They want to move fast. They want to have all of the choice freedom to choose services or other things that they might want to do. The drawback, though, is they didn't realize uh, at the time what that meant for being on call, as an example. And that, on it, honestly, that was the, the 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 real big watershed moment for people as they started to realize, oh, well, hang on a second. If I make that choice, I'm on call for everything. Yes, and the way that our application is structured still as a monolith, that means that we can't actually have that be the case because if you're on call for that, you actually have to be on call for everything because of the way monoliths work. Then we started to realize, okay, we got to do things a little bit differently. The way I've described this is your, your, your goal with these things is the most safety at speed or the fastest you can possibly run while being safe. And if you find them, that, that, that magical point on the curve overlap, this is where you want to be. And it, the, we all know that the most secure network is one that's not connected to anything. And the fastest you can possibly go is when you don't log, you don't error check, and you don't care about what actually happens. So you can't, you, we already automatically already care about some of the overlapping concerns. We just need to find the points on the curve where they overlap for our organization. Once you get people in a room to have that conversation, most of the misgivings or kind of concerns go away. Um, it's just a, you have to walk through the steps. I don't think in any sufficient, I mean, separation of concerns really uh, should allow that to, they don't need to communicate if you think about it that way at some point. If you're, if you, if you're a well-run organization, you shouldn't actually have to care about that, to be honest with you. But uh, if you're, and maybe this is a non-manimous thing for me to say, but if you're not a well-run organization, you might be crutching your organizational misgivings or inefficiencies by saying you all need to talk to each other on a regular basis to do this. It's, you know, maybe classic growing organization stuff. I never was too concerned about that for what it's worth. I don't think the ops team needed to fully, fully, fully appreciate why something was done in GitHub issues for everything to run well. Maybe it, was, it would be better in some cases they did, but I think it was more like at the edges. Like if there was something esoteric going on, maybe they needed to understand that, but then they can have that conversation. But the way that we organized ourselves, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, I think the one caveat there would be, the difference would be once you pull something out of code and start putting it in more infra primitives, then that team who manages the infra primitives has to understand some of the things. So again, like if you pull something out of um, just straight up Ruby, Node, Go, whatever code, and you're going to go throw it on to you know, Kafka to go do something, you probably have to have a conversation about what here is going to happen. But that's different, I think, than just saying like, ops needs to talk to dev. Most of your life as a development organization, you likely should just stay on GitHub and Heroku and not have this concern. And if you do, you can hit product market fit, you can hit major scale, you could become a top 20 website running off exclusively off of GitHub and Heroku. Um, multi-billion dollar organizations do this um, all the time. But there, if you're that successful, there likely will become a point when you want to consider something different and you need to consider something different. But there is a middle ground between GitHub and Heroku and Microsoft. And the only people in the world in five years in the future that I hope are developing their own very bespoke internal development platforms are people like Microsoft, Google, and Facebooks of the world. We're, we're talking about trillion dollar trending companies because even then your investment in that shouldn't you should try to find something off the shelf but currently nothing off the shelf really exists let's just be honest it's like it's no it's no person's land at the moment but there is a difference between when you go from a monolithic application and a monolithic database and a monolithic cluster to your first service and so that's the zero to one when you do that and it's not that hard you understand how you're going to manage it all that sort of stuff but you, it, it's like going from zero kids to one kid the world changed for you overnight. It did. And once you, once you go past that, nothing will ever be the same and you should get ahead of it. You don't though, until you've had your in services case, probably your 50th service. And everyone's like, this doesn't work. We're in trouble. 
So understand that the moment you went, you enter that land, you know, one service, another cluster, um, another database, or sorry, another data center need or any of those things, you're in a different world. There's a reason why engineering operations is a rising trend. And it's because people think about this at the moment, which is we need to serve our internal developers just as much as we're serving external customers or developers. And the, the, the truth is that most people are reaching for Kubernetes and they're trying to figure it out um, and how to manage it themselves. If we can solve this problem from a product perspective and someone could buy something past Heroku to this before they go and build a, a very bespoke one, they can delay that. If they can delay that decision to develop their own internal one, they have much better chance of surviving as a company. If you have to dedicate more of your attention to this and you don't have the luxury of hundreds of millions of dollars in funding or insane explosive growth or you know, soft bank underwriting a billion dollars of loss each year to do this, you have a better chance of survival. And that's like the truth. It's so, you know, there's a reason why SaaS products and have taken off and it's because it gives you a better shot of being a good business.